web stream. I, I hope it's not live because I'm going to tell you a story that my wife would not appreciate. It is now. Oh, I'm live. I'll just say that I was on a Zoom call this afternoon. It was quite important, and I couldn't make the audio work. Hmm. Have you ever been in a Zoom call? <laughs> <laughs> No, that's that's what they heard. My wife would say, I can't hear you. <laughs> and I never did get it. Never right all the way to the end. Everybody seemed happy at the end and all went away and that's because I contributed nothing. <laughs> that's because they yeah. took all your money and they didn't really need you. <laughs> John has bought and his wife have bought a ranch outside Santa Fe, so that's what that's all about. But let's start over again. Good evening, everybody. Those of you watching us virtually, and we're sorry about the weather. Who knew that there would be a monsoon in Phoenix on October 3rd? Anyway, for those of you who are brave enough to come out tonight, and I see a lot of you, thank you very much for coming. And we're delighted that you're here to celebrate our, well, you're here to see John, but it coincidentally, it's our 33rd birthday. I can hardly remember. I mean, have any of you been here the entire time? I know I'm the oldest person in the room, but no, seriously. Yeah. Hmm? No, I am. Um, Karen, I was the only employee at the Poison Inn for the first two years. We opened in 1989. And then in 1991, Karen came to work. And then we hosted Left Coast Crime in 1995. And we acquired Patrick in the back. So he's been here ever since. Young Pat started as an intern when he was 16 years old, which was over 20 years ago. He's still here. Um, John Goodwin came right about that time. So it's amazing, you know, that they're they're still here and we're still here, but it's all thanks to you and to others like John. How long have we been doing this together? I don't know, but when did I first come? It must have been in the early 90s. It was. Yeah, we've been doing this forever. In fact, C.J. Box has spent his entire career here. I mean, we have launched every C.J. Box book since he started. Um, but you were already a major star by the time I opened the store, so we haven't no, quite as big a history. I opened in 89, because I, I first, Rules of Prey came out of 90. Did it? Yeah. But you didn't come here. No, I want to replace all the stuff. <laughs> <laughs> we were too small, and I will tell you the truth that it was very, very hard to convince anyone in New York that a bookstore in Scottsdale would attract readers or an audience. Um, you know, they were right across us to the coast, to uh, San Francisco and Los Angeles and all. And I kept saying to them, there are loads of readers in Phoenix, they're retired people, there are people who are here for their health. There are people in the university. Arizona State's one of the biggest universities, maybe the biggest in the country at this point. Um, you know, I, but it was really a struggle to get authors here for a few years. But now, now here we are, right? We're so lucky that we get such a great... How many of you get our e-news and saw our calendar for October, right? And it's even, it's just as wonderful for November. And, you know, I look back and I think, wow, perseverance, that's what it really takes. But it takes all of you. So thank you very much for that. Congratulations. Well, thank you. Um, but it's due to the whole, the whole staff. I was trying to indicate that it was only me for just a little while, and then it's been everybody else all this time. Patrick, you want to come take a bow? Because Karen's <laughs> not here. <laughs> so next to Karen, you're the, you're the next longest serving person. Yeah, hey. I was 14 years old when I started. <laughs> 14, yeah. Yep. And you know, book selling has really evolved. Patrick's career here at the store has evolved over time um, from working on the store selling books to now doing lots of IT and, um, you know, adapt. We, we have to keep adapting as things keep changing, COVID threw a real wrench in so many things, and uh, we're still not sure how it's all going to settle out. And I want to thank all of you who sent a donation or bought a t-shirt. Um, I think the t-shirts are approaching 200 people now, which is awesome. Um, and that really helps because the shipping system is so out of whack at the moment. Anyway, enough of that. Let's talk about Righteous Pray because we're well, actually here. I'm going to have a couple comments about all of too. The, the fact is, is that when I started, about the time she started, uh, authors uh, were sent all over the country to uh, to promote their books because, you know, we, it was early days of the internet. The internet was 
just barely getting going. Uh, and uh, there, there were just, it was just no way really to promote the books except to have the authors go out and try to do whatever they can. And the idea was to sell as many books as you can in as short a period as you can, right at the point the book came out, hoping to boost it on the New York Times, bestseller list, and the other smaller bestseller lists around the country. And when I first started, uh, I would have a suitcase about the size of a book truck. And, and uh, because what you would do is you would, is you would go to the first store, which would be feeling pretty good at this point. You'd go to the first store and you'd sign books. And then you'd go to the next city. But to get to the next city, you would usually have to get on an airplane at like 7 o'clock in the morning. So that meant you had to get up out of the hotel at 4.30. And then, you know, you'd, the limo would pick you up at 5 and then take you there. And then when you got to the town that you were going to, like Los Angeles, there would be a woman there. And it was always, well, with one exception, a guy in Chicago. There was always a woman, and she'd have uh, a you know kind of high mileage car, and she'd drive like crazy all over town, every bookstore, and she'd just pull up. She'd know where every one of them was. She'd pull up in front of the store, the author would jump out, run in the store, all the books would be piled there. You sign them all, come back up, jump in the car, and she'd take oh, off. The next. So you do that all day, and then at seven o'clock, you were supposed to do a presentation like this one, and by that time you're wasted because you know you got up at 4 30 in the morning and then you're so jacked up by the time you get out of the show that you're supposed to go back to the hotel and sit because you got to get up at 4 30 the next morning because every day you've got to catch that early flight to get there in time to do all the running around after by the time you get two weeks into that you're damn near dead and you're also toying around a huge uh suitcase because in, in those early days most authors they didn't dress like this I only dress like this you know, since I made the best seller list. <laughs> and I, when I was trying to impress people, I wore a suit and tie. So I had like four or five suits. I've never seen you here in a suit and tie, seriously. Well, I don't think you guys seriously. <laughs> but at any rate, the, the uh, uh, no, I, I wore jackets here before. Maybe, maybe, not, jackets, maybe not Nick. I, don't think so. I eventually streamlined the golf shirts, jeans, and, and sport coats because that looks pretty decent from just you know talking but anyway by the time there were times toward you know as i was getting older uh you know like in 2000 when we were still doing this stuff i sat in the airport and cried you know, i couldn't you know it was, it was two weeks i didn't even know where i was and you know I, and i'm supposed to i'm supposed to be nice to people and and, <laughs> and it had all these strange things happen i you know, I, I went to Los Angeles, or not to Los Angeles, San Francisco once, and I'd already been on the bestseller list 15 times. The woman had no idea that, that I, I was a best-selling author. She dropped me off at the wrong hotel, because it turns out that if you're a best-selling author, you get put in nice hotels. If, if you're not a best-selling author, you know, you're down in a local raffle. And, uh, and I spent a lot of time in raffles. And... and uh, that was that was the way it went, and then all of a sudden it just stopped because of the internet. Because the internet is so much more effective than promoting books. Amazon came along, so much more effective. Than so everybody, and now we've got what's the name of the woman on the bestseller list? Hoover, Hoover, Colleen Hoover, a top, TikTok star. Colleen Hoover's got four books in the top ten on the New York Times bestseller list because she's a TikTok star. I barely know what TikTok's I <laughs> did. I knew that I I. I called up YouTube. This is something else I want to address. I called up YouTube, and here are ten like TikToks things up in front of me, okay? And it, it's these young women doing TikTok dances. And so I click on one, and it's 15 seconds long. Mm -hmm. They do they do a, a, a dance like this, and then it just stops. Well, what's that? And this woman is a TikTok star, and she's got four books in the New York Times bestsellers. It's fine with me. Anything you do, any I, I you know, if you're a writer, you're okay. But I can't believe it because you know, like, it just strikes me as so weird. I mean, I, I just don't understand how that works because I come from the rolling the giant suitcase through the airport, you know, <laughs> and this woman probably doesn't go leave her basement. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm that might well be true. So, but aren't we lucky that John still comes to see us, right? Actually, in his last book, we were at the book tour. So, the next thing I, I just wanted to say about all that passive time is, 
is that when you read my books, there will be a hundred words in there that did not, did not exist when I started. Well, what the, just COVID, you know, didn't exist. You know, uh, I say that, you know, uh, uh, somebody is running, uh, somebody's got two gigs of memory. You know, what does that mean? You know, in, 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 one, in 1989. And now it's Bitcoin in this book. And now yeah, it's what's a Bitcoin? Thing, right? and, and, uh, and, and all those words simply didn't exist. And now, if you took this back back in time to 1989, nobody would understand it. And, but the words in it are just in common usage. They've all been invented since. Uh, I mean, this is really a revolutionary time when it comes to language. And stuff. I just hope it does. I hope the language doesn't go away completely, and that you know all information on like uh, astrophysics starts getting relayed through TikTok videos. <laughs> 19 seconds at a time in astrophysics. And, uh, could you give me my book? That's actually your book, but my copy. Yeah. So that's, that's the end of my talk. Well, I want to, since I'll you've already addressed that, and we're talking about language, one of the things I find absolutely, I love this book, one of the things I particularly loved about it is that John not only is very funny, even though there's a high body count, but you're all kind of used to that, right? Um, but, oh, I love it. Right. It's been higher in the past. It has been higher in the past, right? Um, and, you know, you have to have a slam bang finish. But John's use of language in this book is absolutely fabulous. And so he's got a, a character, Kid. Remember Kid? So he's an IT guy here with Virgil and um, Lucas. And they need him to um, stop the cameras in the house they're going to break into, which they're clearly not supposed to go down. So <laughs> while they're talking, while they're talking to Kid, he's chomping on celery. And I love this. Here's the last line of this section. I'll get back to you, Kid said. There was the final Solaric crunch, and he hung up. Now, I mean, you could read a lot of authors, and how many of them are ever going to talk about the Solaric crunch? <laughs> the one I got, the one I got half of about, the one I got half of about last time was I described the bar as being uh, clitoral pink. Oh, wow. <laughs> What can you say? I mean, you know, that's what color it's be you know, right? What? So, uh -huh. I love, you know, I love the thing. Ban books, they, they want to ban books so that nobody gets any sex education, but they don't want to sell contraceptions or abort. I can't see where it's all going, but anyway, we'll get we'll that. Going back. Um, there are also there are also abbreviations that it, when you're talking about ICE, you know, capital I-C-E, but, you know, we would have thought that that was, in fact, you know, the stuff that comes out of your freezer, right? So it's it's not just words. Well, that is the word now, but it's an abbreviation. <laughs> so you've adapted to it, but I... Actually, you know, ICE has got like three definitions that didn't exist. You know, like it's a drug, and it's like this uh, uh, group of banditos, or group of federal banditos down on the border, and what else? The um, people that are... And ice cubes. Oh, right. Like regular ice. Yeah. Yep. So, anyway, Righteous Prey, you, Virgil and Lucas are together. Now, they've been briefly together, right, in other books, but here they actually get to be a team. So, um, well, it's your story. Why don't you tell me how it sets up? Or if you've forgotten, I'll do it. But I <laughs> hope that you actually remember this one. <laughs> I mean, you, you want me to tell them how the, how the start book starts? I do. Okay, a bunch of really rich people who made their money in Bitcoin have gotten bored. Uh, and they decide they start killing assholes. And I, <laughs> I, I pardon me for using the word, but that's their word. And they decide that they'll each kill one to start with. And then after that, but the thing is, is that they can't just let it go at that of, of killing these people. They have got to uh, publicize them. So before, as each killing take places, there's a press release, in which they describe what they did and why. And then, because they're all Bitcoin rich, they give a Bitcoin, each of them gives a Bitcoin, five Bitcoins per, per, per killing, to some charitable organization in that town where they carry the killing out. And then they challenge the people who get the, who get the address for the Bitcoin wallet they challenge those people, are you going to accept it or not? Are you going to take this blood money or and use it for good purposes, or are you going to turn it down because it's blood money? You know, what are you going to do? Are you going to, you know, like one of them goes to the Street of Hope in San Francisco, uh, to to which is a, a 
to help street people. Are you going to take the, the $200,000 or are you just going to blow it off because, you know, it was a result of a murder? And so that that's sort of the setup for it. And there is a killing in San Francisco is the first one. Um, the, the second one is in uh, Houston, although the woman who carries out the second one lives in New Orleans. Uh, the third one is in Minneapolis, St. Paul. Fourth one is in Cleveland, and the fifth one is New York, uh, is in Long Island, actually. And uh, that's what the plan is at any rate. And uh, and what happens is because it's an interstate thing, the FBI gets involved with it. And uh, because the third was is in Minnesota, where it actually the book actually starts, the other ones are just kind of a setup thing. Uh, Davenport gets involved. And then uh, one of Davenport's longtime friends, it goes back probably 15 years of my book series, is now a deputy director of the F FBI, and he drags Davenport and dra into it, and Davenport drags it further, uh, much to their later regret, I have to say. Uh, but but uh, so that that's uh, that's the setup. Well, I mean, I think it's sort of a worthy endeavor, you know, to cleanse the gene pool, so to speak, the way they're doing it. I love the way that the the Bitcoin thing that they're paying, it's almost like doing carbon offsets, you know? I mean, it, it really struck me, you know, you eliminate this guy and then, you know, you create money to help people. And also, you know, did you, yeah, John has learned something because when he wrote a Virgil Flowers, do you remember the one about the um, religion of trying to remember, what was it called? The one, the Virgin thing? I'm trying to remember the title, it was Virgil and, oh God, where is it here? Only Ghost. You know, Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. Do you remember Holy Ghost? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. So Holy Ghost was set up with a series of killings. And when I read it, I said to Jen, structurally, I said, you, you didn't structure this book right when you had a discussion about it. It would have been better, it would have been better if, if an earlier person had been the actual target, not the last person. And Jen said to me, but if I changed it now, he said I'd have to write a whole lot more, so it's just going to live like it is. But in this one, in this one is the third. Well done. Yep. It's the third. <laughs> Why well, I attribute that to you? You know, I you. But, but the, 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 uh, but there, I mean, there was more than one reason for making it the third one. Right. Um, you have to bring, among other things, yes. Lucas and Virgil into this soul. And we have to have, uh, it has to be important enough to get them involved. Right. Uh, you know, right for start. So that's why. That's if it had been the first one, it wouldn't have been as um, attention grabbing, right. and whatever it is. So the third one. And if you haven't been to the Twin Cities, because John lived there for such a long time, there's a lot of great travel around the Twin Cities, local geography, you know, it feels. Um, and so Lucas, who's been like all over the country since you made him a U.S. Marshal, is he home just kind of resting? Why is he in the Twin Cities? Because, you know, you've sent him to Florida and New Orleans and Washington. And wherever. Well, that's where he lives. Oh, well, so, I know, yeah. but that's my point. Why is he home just kind of... I think in the next book, he may be either in northern Minnesota or in northern Wisconsin. And I don't think Virgil's going to be in there, but I'm not sure yet. I'm not even sure I'm going to write it yet, but I mean, I, I, I think... <laughs> That, that that looks like we're too. But when you made Lucas a U.S. Marshal, it was let's just be air conditioning. It's not the roof blowing out. It's not a rain. You know, now it's here. I once in the early days when I was dragging that books with a size bag around. Uh, I once had two readings intercepted by the same tornado. One, oh in, my God. one there was a tornado warning. I like, actually it wasn't developed into a tornado but a line of storms that was coming toward St. Louis and uh and the thing was I mean you know people were saying it's gonna blow the roof off the shopping center or something like that and people were really getting concerned. And I made it out to the airport and we were like on the last plane out it, it landed across the river in Illinois and where the University of Southern Illinois is where the that is. Carbondale. Carbondale. Yeah Carbondale. Uh, went into Carbondale and the, then the tornado came and uh, knocked the lights out. But anyway. Yes. All right. So the guy is not a mystery and it's not a spoiler who the, who the bad guy is in the Twin Cities because, you know, the object is how to catch him, not how to, not who is he, but, you know, can we do that? His name is Magruder and they thought you had a really great time writing him because he prides himself on having these kind of ninja skills. 
you know, where he has a safe room in his house and the whole bit. And I love the I love the whole way that, you know, you where he's trying to stay ahead of Davenport and, and Flowers. But the guy's a putz, essentially. Yeah. Um, so even his mother didn't like well, there's that. Um, but you, know, you say you don't like superheroes, but I, I, I thought it was the guy thinks he's trained to be the superhero Super. kind of killer, but he's not. He's not. Yeah. But he kills people. He's not a superhero, but he kills people. And but he thinks he's a superhero. He takes knife training. He takes defensive driving. He takes you know offensive driving. He <laughs> he takes gun lessons. He does all this kinds of stuff with. Him take karate lessons, he boxes, he does all this kind of stuff because he's basically fundamentally bored of the street. And, and, but he did invest a lot of, of an inheritance in Bitcoin just basically because he didn't know what else to do with it and made a huge amount. One of the things I liked about this book, to tell you the truth, is if you think about it, and I suspect this is the thought that has, has, has passed through a lot of people's heads, the world would be a lot better place we could just get rid of a few hundred people. <laughs> Not even that many. I mean, imagine the change if we get rid of Vladimir Putin. Oh, oh, just that one guy. Huge change. You know, and then then you start thinking, you start adding the list up. And, 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 and that's why that's why these people are getting rid of assholes. It's because it's not criminals who are really messing this up. Because criminals belong for it's assholes that cause the problems. <laughs> because 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 they exploit other people and, and and they mess with them often in ways that it's not illegal uh, or if it is illegal they're too clever and they get away with it you know, so so that you know how did Vladimir Putin uh, go from from being originally elected as kind, in kind of a democratic process to what he is now where he's threatening to use atomic weapons against his own people what a monster and and. And, and so then you start making up a list. How many people would you have to get rid of to, to change the world? You a couple hundred. And, and that's what the bad guys are doing. That's what Davenport stops, prevents. So then uh, I'm going to go down on a complete side trip. I've been, I've been vegging out for the last, since I finished the last Letty book, in front of the television set. I've been watching the old house medical series. Okay. Oh, yeah. uh -huh. So one of the stories in the house thing was that an African dictator who's dying of some unknown disease comes to this hospital because house is a diagnostic genius and can fix it. One of the doctors kills him, kills the dictator because and it violates every ethical and moral standard that he supposedly swears to as a doctor, but he knows that that guy goes back and he's been told this, this doctor, the young doctor been told this by several people from that country. If he goes back, he's gonna kill hundreds of thousands of people. So the doctor kills him. Very logical. But on the other hand, it's got a real nasty morality problem there and an ethical problem for the special doctor. And uh, but that's that's the kill the one asshole about it. And, and uh, I didn't I didn't get that for this book. I didn't start re doing the house series until a month ago, I guess. Uh, but but uh, it's the same problem. Just get rid of not too many people. It all be happy. No. Did you get that from the road? Pardon me? Did you get that from the road? From other Hitchcock's the road? Where they had that typical conversation about whether it was okay to murder people mm -hmm. for the betterment of society. Well, I'm not hearing that I get it from the, the movie that the, the story, the movie they wrote. It was the novel by like Lord Douglas, actually, yes. about the road. Oh, are you talking about the Jesus thing? Oh, oh. well, R.O.P. No, I've not heard of it. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, so you said rope? I well, thought you meant the rope. Oh, okay. Different. And that was a whole medical conversation about, and actually killed somebody, mm -hmm. just because they Well, killing someone just because you can is different than killing somebody. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, that's, yeah. Anyway, that's, that's really true. true. Occasionally, I think we're living in times where it's so difficult to grasp or to figure out how to get out of some of these predicaments, you know, even though you don't believe in superheroes, you almost sort of wish that, you know, well, you know one would come along and clear it. You know, the, the whole thing is it's not a new idea. 
The word assassin comes from a uh, from a Middle Eastern Arabic cult called the Hashashin, who, who took hashish, dope, and then they would go around and kill people. They supposedly worked for uh, 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 an Arabic leader called the Old Man of the Mountains, who would send his assassins out to kill people that needed assholes, to kill assholes <laughs> who needed to be killed. And so, and so uh, they would go and they would sacrifice their own lives if necessary, sort of like uh, suicide bombers now, and, and they would kill these people that needed to be gotten rid of. And, and he was greatly feared, and it might all be a myth anyway, but but anyway, that's where the word assassin comes from. Well, you do, you do, you know, you do have a problem here, and that the people who are getting killed are all people that the world is better without. But on the other hand, it's not okay, you know, for unauthorized people to do it. So, it's not okay for authorized people to do it. Well, there's that. It's, that it, it's, the whole, it's the whole question Plato raised forever ago. You know, who will govern the governors? You know, if everybody becomes one, then then where are we? Do you have any questions? Not to be a contrarian, but there's always a replacement willing to come along. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, but there's... but, but uh, Somebody said, and, uh, and it might have been LBJ, that uh, uh, somebody said, LBJ said that the rule would be a better place. It just let me hang one person a year. And the person was talking to me said, I don't think one person would be enough. And he said, no, but I get the word around that, that several people are candidates for the <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so, so, you know, if, if you notice that... Uh, that a large number of assholes who are in your cohort of assholes are getting killed and that change of hate. Well, there's a whole great but man's I, but school. I, I understand. Well, yeah, sorry. there's a great man's school of history that, you know, depend, history may depend on a few individuals. Some, many people disregard that and say it's all various forces at work and so forth. But, you know, if you look at Napoleon, if you look at Hitler, currently you look at Putin or or Orban or Bolsonaro or whatever it is, and you think, okay, you know, would, would there be a worse replacement with the Chechen guy who really wants to use, you know, atomic weapons to replace Putin? But then, you know, I think this is really, in a way, what John's talking about. The guy that said, and I, I thought it was Machiavelli, but it wasn't somebody else, that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts. They absolutely wasn't kidding. And it can be political power, because we're seeing that all the time. But in this case, what John is talking about is people who become inordinately rich. I mean, they are not just billionaires, but multi-billionaires by a fluke, because they decided to invest in Bitcoins. And when you have that kind of money, and people really are afraid of it, you know, it becomes power um, in that you can buy people's cooperation, you can scare people off, whatever it is. Gradually, they become corrupted. I mean, I have seen it with some celebrities over the course of 33 years, but what happens is if somebody becomes really famous or really rich, what happens is they get people, because they, they need people to deal with stuff. And the people keep their jobs because they filter back to that person, whatever that person wants to hear or whatever will help the people keep their jobs. I once I once got involved in that entirely by accident by driving a famous author somewhere and listened to the conversation. I didn't drive him, but I drove some of the people that worked with him and listening to their conversations, I was absolutely appalled. Um, because what I learned from that was that the famous author didn't was no longer in touch with reality because all the people around him were feeding him stuff that made their jobs secure or, or, you know, bought into his well, vision. Well, tell us who it was. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, if you, if you actually look at... It wasn't me. You know, <laughs> I've never been through it. <laughs> I'll drive you next time. Right? Exactly. If you look at Putin, you know, he clearly had terrible advice. He really thought he could just like go into the Ukraine and knock them all over. And, That's you know, and, and, and he was living in a bubble. And, and it's an increasing bubble that he may not be able to find his way out of. But, but it was because people told him what he wanted to hear. 
rather than what he needed to hear. And, you know, that's sort of what's going on in this book with these guys uh, when they get together. I think there's a real moral lesson there about, you know, that's not what I was going for. <laughs> no, I know. That's, that's, that's fine for entertainment. I understand that. But when you read it, you really do recognize. You keep saying, the guy was so rich, now he's poor. Yeah. You know, that's a terrible thing to be. That's an awful place to be. If you are so bored, you have to start thinking about killing people, you know, um, because it's going to be a way to relieve your boredom, you know. But... It's, a, it's an interesting design. You raise a lot of questions in it that I'm not sure you actually intended to do, but it's just working out that way. Right? Yep. Because you, you just wrote it damn fun. No, well, no. I mean, I, you know, there are other reasons to write it, but I mean, you know, like, uh, among other things, well, I mean, I try to vary the kind of stuff that I write. And, and this was a little bit different than a lot of the other stuff that I've written in the last 20 years. So... I, I, have, I have written books in which the bad guy gets away and the bad guy's really bad, uh, but still but still escapes. And some in a couple of cases, a bad woman. Uh, and uh, so, it, you know, you write so many serial killer books and you write so many, uh, you know, uh, wife kills husband or vice versa books and you do, well, you know, I did a couple of books uh, about, People who just murdered people went on the run and had to be chased down, and so then you start start to branch out. Uh, Ocean Prey was uh, was a kind of a different branch of that because it it, it you know it brought Lucas and and uh, Deb were together. But the first time I'm talking about the mafia, and I've never talked about the mafia. Um, by the way, well, no, I'm not going to do it. Uh, the what I, what I was about to say is that some woman has written a book about the uh, about the Italian branches of organized crime, which are not all the mafia; they're all separated. Mm -hmm. Apparently, it's a pretty great book. It was interviewed, it was reviewed in the New York Times, a true a, a true history going back to the early 1900s, I believe, uh, about women who became powerful in the mafia, including one in the early days who not only ordered a rival to be killed and thrown down a well after she was killed. But had the woman's two-year-old daughter murdered, and uh, so I mean, uh, there's some really rough stuff out there that's real, and uh, and uh, I've done a lot of that. But it seems like when you start looking at true crime, that there's a lot more that you could actually write about. It's, it's, I mean, you know, like I when I read that, I thought, boy, that's that's pretty severe, you know, killing a two-year-old. So I mean, deliberately, not not by accident. Well, there's a lot of true crime. It's, it's one of those things that is surging up in popularity. And part of that is podcasts. You know, I'm old enough to remember radio. Remember when we used to listen to the radio and, you know, there was all this wonderful drama and suspense. And it was, it was an entirely different experience than watching it. I mean, it's completely different than television. And now podcasts are coming back and, um, and we're getting, it's basically radio all over again. I find it fascinating. The television's half advertising. Well, depends on what you're watching, but I mean, there should be the 250 it, it streaming is. services really there is. are, right? But you know, the thing about it, the difference, the main difference between podcast and radio and uh, television and newspapers, as far as that goes, is that those all had a central control, and podcasts are everywhere. They're everywhere. It doesn't make any difference how stupid, ignorant, or smart and, uh, and uh, thoughtful you are. You can have a podcast. It doesn't make a difference. I mean, I watch podcasts on on must and uh, you mean probably you to one of the stu yeah, probably one of the stupidest sports ever invented. Uh, and uh, and God help me, I watch YouTube videos on golf. I mean, I mean, there really isn't any coming back from that. <laughs> but, uh, but the difference is, is that it's coming from the bottom, not. From not from the, it's not coming down on top of it from mm -hmm. from supposedly smart people in the studio in New York City. Well, we get enough of that still, but but uh, but, but that's what technology better. is allowing. It allows anybody to become an influencer. It allows anybody to start a podcast. You know, um, and you, you're right. You lose that, but you come. You know, you come from newspapers where there were like standards and editors and all kinds of stuff. 
Yeah, there's also bigotry and wrongheadedness and stupidity in newspapers. Too. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, I don't use the N word if I can avoid it, but uh, I once did a story about a race riot in Cairo, Illinois. And uh, I referred to a black guy there as a, uh, as a reverend, something like that. The editor who was up at the front of the room read my copy and he said, I'm not called that N word a reverend. He was graduated from the Jesuit Theological College. And uh, uh, wasn't going to call him that because he was involved in this uh, racial dispute in Cairo, Illinois, which is one of the ugliest ones in the country at the time. It was so ugly that uh, when somebody ordered the swimming pool segregated, and instead of segregating, it looked city port of full concrete. So they didn't even just give it to the black folks and now which they could have done. At which point, the black people in town decided that they would no longer buy anything from any store in Cairo, since uh, since they had made up fifty percent of the population, and really started going broke. And that's and then, then that things really turned bad. So, at any rate, that's an happy story. <laughs> Probably straight away from Righteous Prey, which I said way back at the beginning was really a lot of fun to read. Um, even though it may not sound like it, but it actually is. It's one of John's, I think, most humorous books, and the style on it is terrific. Do you find, as you know, you're getting older, that you're, um, what's the word I want? You're more unfiltered? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, uh, I, I am getting older, and, and, uh, and, uh, uh, I, I think that I think that politics have been creeping into my ghost story. Well, there are there are some some there, there's some attitudes in there, and uh, I don't make any bones about the fact that I'm very moderately liberal, uh, and and uh, and I know a lot about guns, and uh, I've got a lot of friends, including my brother, who are extremely conservative, and that I and I still like them. Even though I'm moderate, and, liberal and, stuff. and and uh, and I am for all of the things that the '60s liberals, the '70s liberals were for, uh, but I am not uh, exactly. Uh, I'm not woke, uh, if that's a real word. Uh, in 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 the, in the worst expression of woke wokeness, uh, although I do believe in some of it actually. But the thing is, is that I try to keep that out of the books, but it seems like in the culture that we're in now, it's very difficult to do that, just because so many things seem to have a political reference to them. I mean, you can't you can't talk about some things in our culture without reference to politics. Um, I, I, Davenport is a U.S. Marshal because he is friends with both a very conservative Minnesota senator and a very liberal senator. And uh, and he's friends with both of them, uh, and and he's he is kind of politically like I am, very moderately liberal, uh, and that. But is it that, that's of sorts, it's, it's kind of starting. To, it used to I used to rigorously keep it out of the books, but now it's starting to bleed into the books. I think probably because I'm getting older. Isn't Minnesota itself an interesting blend of conservatism and, and you know I mean. We were in Minneapolis for the crime convention just a while ago, and I was remembering, you know, they had really serious riots mm -hmm. in Minneapolis, and yet, you know, I think that much of Minnesota is very conservative. So yeah, outside outside the cities, outside the yeah. cities, yeah. Uh, outside you get in your rural Minnesota, it's conservative. It's, it's conservative, but you know, it's not it's not crazy conservative. It's conservative. Right. And, and, I mean, you know, people ought to pay a little bit more attention to what conservatives say sometimes because sometimes what they say is very really useful. Mm -hmm. Even if you don't agree with it, it's useful to think about it. Because that's, that's segregating off the crazies, the nut jobs, because we've got enough nut jobs without, you know, but, uh, uh, but Minnesota is like that, yes. You know, and, and you see a lot of people conflicted between, I mean, you know, like, like people who are uh, pro-choice, and at the same time uh, they care, they've got guns. Uh, so you know, like I, I, you know, you know, farm people like that who, who, in some ways, are quite liberal, and in other ways, you know, they hunt, they fish, and they do all that kind of stuff like I do. And and a lot of people who are 
who are liberals wouldn't do that. There's, there's kind of an interesting cultural thing. Like how many people here come from basically smaller towns and things? And, and, and the thing is, is that what I'm finding is that when I try to work out these books and I'm talking about different groups of people, is that, is that we really live in a couple of different cultures. We are very different from each other. And that's one of the reasons, that's one of the parts of the problem of, of the split of the country, is that if you live in New York City, or Phoenix, or San Diego, or Los Angeles, you are dependent on your neighbor, on your neighbor behaving, your neighbor doing certain things in a certain way. Uh, if you live in an apartment building, you've got to be cooperative. That's a hell of a lot different than, than living on a farm in Iowa, where, where your nearest neighbor is a mile, literally a mile away, and where you might be 15 miles from town. Because then you're very dependent on yourself. You've got your own sewer system, you've got your own water system, or you get you get the power from the co-op, but it's it's not like you're depending on the guy on the other side of the wall. And so you come from these different cultures. People in the country understand that you might have to have a gun. People in New York City think if you have a gun in the house, you're probably going to kill somebody when you're crazy. So, so and they don't understand each other. If they're in the country, they probably aren't connected to the internet, at least connected in a fast way. Not in a fast way. But, but now that Elon Musk has started <clears throat> that thing, maybe they will be connected. Yeah. Yeah. The cell service, though, is surprisingly ubiquitous and, you know, and fast, and you can connect on your on your you can but you know, self that's that's fairly recent yeah i mean a lot of a lot of rural people haven't had the opportunity to have facebook in front of them or TikTok, like you say or this and whether it's good or bad that gets into your into your ecosystem and it right either warps your mind or it opens up your well one of the problems though is that people tend to they don't try to open their mind. They look for other people who are like them. So that you wind up with, with big groups of people who are all alike. And uh, and now, according to you know, the newspapers that are reading stuff, a lot of the country is sort of, is sort of splitting apart and people, you know, like people from Wyoming would move to Texas, but people in New York would never move to Texas. People from Texas move to Wyoming, but they're not going to move to New York City. You know, they're afraid of it. So, so you have... You know, well, you just had that kind of experience. That's fun to play with, by the way, when you're writing novels. And, and uh, it's interesting to play with. So. Um, I think, too, that you've got a, a whole different mentality, too. I mean, people on the coast see that as what America is. And they even have names for, you fly over the Rust Belt or whatever they, you know. Right. And I, I think that uh, it's becoming more and more pronounced. Well, not only is it pronounced, I, you know, I, I work for a newspaper for for having And the thing is, if you read the New York Times, and I read the New York Times almost every day, along with the Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, uh, if, you, if you read a story about, um, if you read a story about white people in the Middle West, it's probably going to be about uh, addicts. Um, you know, meth or, or heroin or, or different opiates. Uh, you know, people in the Rust Belt suffering all that kind of stuff. My, my brother lives in a town of 500 people in, in Iowa, and he's, he's happy. And, and, you know, he knows all these neighbors. You know, goes into Waterloo when he has to, all that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, he's happy out there. Uh, and the thing is, is that, uh, is that I don't think that basically editors the New York Times, if they're not from New York, if they come from the Middle West or something, fled the Middle West to get to, get to New York. And so they don't like it that and, and they have no idea what's going on in the Middle West. And I don't think Washington Post is a little different because Washington Post is very oriented toward politics and sort of talks to a lot of people, politicians, in the the country. But um, um, it's, it's, it's a strange situation. But, but it's kind of ripe with the ability, with, with, uh, with the possibilities of, of writing novels. Um, so I, I don't know if more, I'm, I'm trying to keep the politics out, but, but you know, it, it seems like they're creeping in a little bit. Anybody, Anybody else? else? Okay, the guy in the, guy in the, 
the PTSD <laughs> had back there. <laughs> I got it. When, when are there going to be more TV shows? I saw the one with a uh, guy that plays Gibbs. That was really cool. And I saw the latest one out. Uh, uh, I haven't had any TV shows. They had... Uh, I've had right. two TV movies made. Movies, yeah. Both of them suck. <laughs> <laughs> Especially when he goes word for word out of the book when a woman's chasing me with a car. <laughs> that. It's like... Yeah, that uh, that's not that's not in my book. Okay. <laughs> the, the, the the movies I don't have anything to do with. The, the rights of the movies are owned by some people out in Hollywood. I don't even talk to them. I don't <laughs> want to talk to them. You know, they're just it's just they're just no damn good. Um, so that's what that is. Anybody else? Yeah, this lady. Barbara mentioned that she thinks this is one of your more humorous novels. What did you? What do you like most about it? I mean, do you like that it's funny or that it's very modern with the Bitcoin? Like, what do you especially enjoy about this novel? What do you like best about Righteous Break? Just the basic idea, I guess, of, of people killing these these assholes. <laughs> I, I really I apologize for that, but there isn't any word. There, there's no English word that describes exactly other than that exactly what these people are, and everybody knows who we're talking about. Depending on what your political complexion are, you may add or subtract some. But basically, <laughs> the group is the same, and and uh, maybe that's the thing that will eventually pull us all together. We'll get, put those. There, who who is the guy that wrote the, the early space? Uh, really kind of far out science fiction. I think the guy was uh, the guy who the answer to everything was 42. Oh, Adams. Yeah, Douglas. Adams. Douglas Adams. The, the Douglas Adams. Adams. The Douglas Adams. Adams. That's right. The picture of his guy. One of the things that happened in one of the Douglas Adams books or in a movie is a, is that is a they found this spaceship out there that was fleeing, and this might have been in a movie, it was fleeing Earth. And all these people thought they were, they, they had avoided a calamity, but there was no calamity. The people of Earth were all the people who were causing all the trouble in the spaceship. <laughs> they, they were avoiding calamity and they all left. And it's like everybody else remained behind celebrating them because they were gone. That's what you do with Putin and put him on a spaceship. Get rid of him. Really good idea. So one of the things that I found really interesting in the book that um, we haven't talked about is, let's say you've got the five, these five people who unite over the fact that they have loads of money and they want to get rid of assholes and all. But a real question is, you know, can a group like that hold together? Or are they, or, you know, what is the glue that holds them together? And if the glue begins to fray, well, they turn on each other which I think is a really, you know, important part of this book, which we haven't really talked about, which we're not going to carry on because that's part of the point of the book. But I do think it's a really interesting question. If you bring a group of people together who are going to act outside societal norm or whatever you want to call it, basically they're going to kill people, you know, are they, are they going to remain cohesive or are they going to split apart it's in, in the base of? So... I thought that was an interesting part to explore, too. And, you know, as an author, did you have any sort of, like, moral quandary here? Or, you know, you just wrote the story and let it happen? Or, Well, you know, the thing is, is that, uh, that people don't really... It, there's a difference between typing and writing a novel. And, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and so you, you struggle with all of it, you know, yeah. from the setup and... How you're going to do everything and how you're going to handle everything and and um you also think about your audience who am i going to offend by doing this you know say okay i don't want to offend my women readers so you're not going to do x and and uh the same thing with the male readers you're not going to do x with the letty davenport books i think i might offend a lot of women because letty likes guns she just always carries one she's got one it saved her life on several occasions but I think a lot of women might not care for a character who really likes guns. I mean, she likes to go out and shoot. She shot a number of people in her life. She's not sorry about it. She's living her life, you know, and all. Uh, but all of that involves calculation when you're writing novels. And, and, and so you actually calculate that. You sit around and think, you know, 
are they going to like that? Are they going to dislike that? Who am I going to lose? You know, who am I going to keep? Um, you know, and, and I have known some women cops who like guns. And, uh, and, and they felt like, you know, guns were sort of an essential part of their life. My, uh, my wife and I, uh, I, I once got a concealed carry permit for uh, New Mexico, not because I wanted to conceal carry, but because I wanted to go through it. I wanted to go through the training, see what people had to do, see what all that kind of stuff. So I went to it, and the instructor was a woman, and she likes guns a lot. She has a lot of guns around her house, and and so, and so, uh, all of the, none of this figuring this stuff out is easy. All of it is calculated. None of it's by mistake. Stephen King, who wrote the best book on writing, I think it's ever been written, and it's called On Writing, very clever title. <laughs> uh, had the thing that he talks about sometimes it's typing. You know, he gets stuck for something, but he keeps rolling along anyway. Uh, and I can pick out when that's happening, Stephen King, because I like his writing a lot. And, uh, but I can tell when he's just typing, because he doesn't know exactly where the story's going to go, but he's got a couple of things he can do, so he's typing along, and it lines so up not being too integral to the rest of the stuff. Uh, but most of it, other than that, is calculation. It's not done by mistake. Absolutely. I mean, it's stuff. It, it takes like four hours to read a book like this. It takes me like uh, eight months to write it. And that eight months is not because I'm typing slow. It's because i got to think about it. It's got a damn page. So, <laughs> oh, yes. Who's your favorite bad guy in all of your books? Uh, Clara Rinker is a woman. Oh, yeah. and, and a lot of people like her because because she was a person who was made bad by by the culture, and and not only that she's a challenge for Davenport, but Davenport winds up getting her shot in the back essentially uh, with a rifle uh, by a sniper. He sets her up, and she doesn't see it coming, and he kills her. And I regret that to this day because I would have liked to have had her at least a couple more books. I remonstrated with John about that. I was really pissed when he killed her. <laughs> <laughs> Um, because she she was she was she was a bad person, but she, I mean she was contract yeah. killer. But, but she uh, you, you create she, really great bad people. Yes. How do you go about that? You know, one of the interesting things in this book is that I have two characters that you will find are very similar, too similar really. One of them is the radio broadcaster at the end of the book, and the other one is the guy who. It's the guy who had the party to get that Davenport winds up figuring some stuff out. Okay. So, but they're the same character. And I didn't realize that until the book was done. And I'm thinking that I had to write a book for those characters. Because these are the guys who think they're really out there and they're really kind of smart and they're really kind of hustling around and everything. But they're really just kind of greedy and stupid. And and but but they're not they're not just stupid, they're actually they're amoral. They're, they're greedy and amoral, and they're smart enough to actually exploit that. So that, so that you know, like the radio broadcaster in this one, uh, who was one of the targets, and I won't tell you more than that, but he's one of the targets that they're looking for. Uh, he, he sells all kinds of terrible crap on the radio program, and he knows it's terrible crap, but he just wants the money, and he's very cheerful about it. And he's just kind of, you know, slapped him on the back, you know, you know, Kind of a bullshitter, he does all this. And, and uh, I like those kinds of characters. You know, they're, they're, I mean, I guess, uh, I guess, the, I guess kind of a low ranking mafia who would be sort of, uh, sort of a uh, case study. There's a character in this book, though, where you several times come back to what is motivating this character and what's motivating this character is that the character really just wants to be rich. Doesn't matter how how it happens or what what the price is paid or whatever, but the overriding drive of this character is to be rich. Um, and yeah, unfortunately, the character is surrounded by people who are rich. Um, you know, from the Bitcoin thing. Um, so you know, I I feel like your years of reporting, when you spend so much time talking to people now, have made you really great.
great a characterization. I mean, I think your characters are really what drive your books, which we all agree with that. Yeah. I mean, it's the people that you know that fascinate you and why they do things. But but you know, I also write flat characters who are not very successful. I mean, I, I I recognize that in my own books, and some of them just don't work very well. But I leave them in anyway because I've already written it. I've got to get the book. Okay, so they're not as rich as I would like. Them to be. But I find that the characters that I feel are the richest are these kind of bumbling guys who go around and kind of disturb everything around them and some of them are pretty smart and some of them got a sense of humor and some of them don't and and they just kind of bash into stuff and uh and i'd like to write a whole book about them but i can't figure out exactly how to do that because davenport has to be involved in things that are serious enough to attract his attention just can't deal with a whole tribe of stupid people see you're all Pardon me? Is he your alter ego? No. No? No. Are He's... any of your characters your alter ego? No. They're, they're, they're all, uh, the question is, is he my alter ego and they're not? Uh, I am nothing like nothing of any of these people. As a matter of fact, uh, I once uh, went uh, to a disastrous reading in Dallas, Texas, I believe, in which two things happened. One was a woman who said, I only came here because I thought you'd be like that, but the staff book you're not. <laughs> and the other half of the... Uh, but do you want the, to be like Lucas? Is the, the, other, the other part of the disastrous reading was that, uh, was that uh, the bookstore, for some reason, wasn't very well air conditioned. And, and it was like a very hot night in May in Austin or Houston. Uh, and a woman in the front row had a disastrous episode of gas. <laughs> it just about cleaned the whole place up. <laughs> I thought people were going to be running for the doors. <laughs> Honest to God, that's like the life of a famous author on tour. <laughs> so, so let's finish up with one thing that we sort of hinted at, but this will be an extra fun thing for you that most people won't know when you read the book. Virgil. Is aspiring is an aspiring author. You know, you saw that in um, in the Letty book and so forth. But Virgil wants to, and Frankie encourages him. So Virgil has an agent. Virgil's agent is John's agent, Paul yes. Esther. And while the book is going on, Virgil book is off with Esther, who is like swanning around in the Hamptons and then getting out a yacht to go somewhere off with publishers and so forth. <laughs> But the publisher that Virgil eventually sells his book to is, in fact, John's publisher. So there's this kind of little inside thing here that um, most people who read this book will not know. But. And Esther, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a joke in the book where Virgil says that the longest conversation he ever had with her was uh, 32 seconds long. And then when he, she, he sells his book, the, the conversation is like 42 seconds long. And after I wrote the book, Esther called me and said, 32 seconds wasn't our longest conversation. And you know what? <laughs> it just about was. We talk about once a year for about 32 seconds. And, uh, and she sells my, and I'm happy, sells my books. And I don't bother her. I think that it's a great partnership. And, and uh, she signed on to each of my books from, you know, when I couldn't write before I learned how to do this, like in 1989, and we have been going ever since then. Yeah. She's very efficient, a woman in few words. You know they hate each other. So. Well, we don't hate each other. <laughs> I'm just mad at her. But that's different. Um, John also, I can tell you, is very lucky in that he has had the same editor, and he and one other author still share this editor who is no longer working for the publisher. But, you know, I think... You say my mention in this book, though. You do. Yeah, another another Easter egg for you in the book. Um, C.J. Box. C.J. Yeah. C.J., who also appears in the book. John actually mentioned several of others. He and John shared this one editor, a um, very distinguished editor, who it's retired from... Carl Hyacinth. Yeah. It was really good. Yeah, right. And he retired sort of out of the one day. You know, surprising us all. He tells me what he thinks, and he knows more about... Thriller novels that make others a face to And, uh, But there's a consistency in still having the same person, isn't it? Yeah, there is. And, and because he also, and also because I got lucky. I got lucky so many times to become a best-selling author. Because becoming a best-selling author takes a lot of work. 
but there's also an element of luck that you just can't buy. And I, I mean, you just, I mean, the first, the first publicist I had somehow talked to somebody at the Wall Street Journal, my very first on, on Rules of Prey, and they gave me a terrific review. And that terrific review almost on the I heard on my first on Rules of Prey hardcover, almost got into the bestseller list. So then the publishing company was making this calculation like maybe we've got something going here, and they put out a big buttload of, of paperbacks and it made the bestseller list. Okay? It's a big deal. But without that review, that might not have ever happened. And, and all along the way, I've been lucky. And so I've been lucky with my publishers. I've been lucky with Neil. I was lucky with Esther. And, um, and, and you put all those things together and you wind up being a bestseller. Those things don't happen when all of a sudden you're selling 3,000 copies a year and, and you're making, you know, $800. So, which I still do, by the way. I've got a Hungarian contract, I think, that paid me six hundred dollars <laughs> six hundred dollars and then i think the hungarian government takes 20 percent for taxes and then the agent in britain because i share it with the one here take another 20 percent and so now i'm down to whatever 60 percent of 600 is. so when you go to Budapest, you can have 360 right the, the guy has actually taken me there and toured me with Hungarian culture. But then the feds and the state take uh, <laughs> and at this point I'm down to uh, $210 or something like that. And, uh, so John doesn't, I think, give himself enough credit for really what a great writer he is, or maybe he just doesn't want to say this, but I'm going to go back. I've told most of you this before, but I think I will end on this. I went to my 45th Stanford reunion, which was quite a while ago, and I signed up for a class in, um, they had an English track for returning alumni, and the class was, the, the thesis of the class was, you know, five five authors would like the best opening pages and the best constructed books. And so I'm sitting there, lots of people, there's a full house, the whole bit. I think she starts out with Jane Austen and Pride and Prejudice, you know, it's the truth universally admired that a, a gentleman in possession of a fortune must be in want of a wife. And then I can't remember what the other, and then she got to the end and she said, now I'm going to surprise you. She said, my fifth author, she said, is John Sanford. And she read a page from one of the prey novels. And, and then, this is the part I love. Then, then she proceeded to give some erroneous information about who John was and all. I, I thought briefly that I would just be quiet, but you've all seen me, you know. I can't <laughs> so I, you know, I raised my hand and I said, "Well, actually," I said, "Blah blah 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 blah." And she glared at me and she said, "Well, how do you know that?" You know, and hands went up all over the room and they said, "She doesn't know. Pay attention," <laughs> which I thought was really fun. But what was great about it was that um, you really. You know, when, when I was a baby editor, John taught me so many things. I've never forgotten. And one of the things you said to me was that a great book has to involve all five senses. And the most important of the five senses to get on the page is the sense of smell. You need to have people aware of, of course, you've already told us about the moment with gas. <laughs> But you need to have that, you know, as yeah. part of the book to really immerse people in in the story. And, you know, you are so good. At, I think, you you know, you're so used to all of this. I don't know that you often give yourself credit for just how good you are. Well, I'll tell you about it. If, if any of you are writers, and if you think about that, uh, you'll realize it's probably true that, that, that if something disgusts you, it's often the sense of smell. And uh, if something you really like, it's often a sense of smell. Not so much vision, really. It's a sense of smell that does it. Um, and so, like, in uh, uh, one of the murders in here, a, a guy gets his throat cut and bleeds to death, and the killer drags his body behind uh, a dumpster where uh, there's a very nauseating smell back there. Not the dead guy. It's the smell of bananas of rotten bananas and rotten garbage behind a dumpster. And I, and I think that when, I think that everybody has that experience and when you say in a book, it clicks them. And it just, it brings them to that experience. Mm -hmm. But when you're right, you're so used to all that, I don't know that you fully give yourself credit for just how well, important do. those kinds of things are. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we've now come to my 
one of my favorite parts of doing these events is we have a couple of books to give away to thank you for coming tonight. Amy, are you up there? Yeah. What are we doing? Okay. Um, I know that there are people who found the weather too challenging, so we might have to call numbers two or three times in case they bought the book, but they're not actually here. So the first book, um, because this is Hispanic Heritage Month, um, is a really nifty first novel, um, and it is called Eva Santos Moon is a burgeoning Chicana artist who practices the ancient spiritual ways of brujeria and curanderisma. But she's at one of her lowest points, and it goes on from there. It's a really wonderful October sort of Halloween thing. It's called River, River Woman, River Demon. Ooh. And Blackstone is a really interesting publisher. That is a small publisher, but they are really coming on strong. And since there are only five major New York publishers left, possibly four if the judge doesn't rule against the merger of Penguin Random House and Simon and Schuster. Blackstone is a publisher that I think we all need to pay attention to. So I try to read more of their books and give them more publicity. So John, can you pick a number between one and 34? One and 34? Mm -hmm. uh, 17. If you have to look in your book because you should have a number. And if 17 isn't here, it will keep going because 17 may not have made it. Right? I didn't see anybody wildly waving their hand. <laughs> 22? 22? Oh, 22. Oh, dear. You say one. All right. Um, nine. Ah, oh, wonderful, sir. We have a winner. So let me pass the hand to this gentleman. The other book I'm going to give away um, is by Jeffrey Archer, who is one of the world's best-selling authors. And just by chance, he has written a book because he's taking his London cop called William Warwick through the ranks of Scotland Yard. So he has, or sorry, the Metropolitan Police. So he has to work different kinds of cases. And just by chance, this book, which he wrote over a year ago, is about the Royal Protection Service, mm -hmm. whom we all saw working during the Queen's mm -hmm. state funeral and whatever. And their job is to protect the royal family. And he set this book in 1988 in London, and the royal under threat is Princess Diana. Um, it's a really neat story, but just by a fluke, it's particularly, I think, a posit to the events of September. Mm -hmm. I did Jeffrey's um, book lunch um, last week, and unfortunately, Facebook had a glitch. Um, but now the, the video is up and it's really, you might want to go and watch it on Facebook or YouTube or listen to the podcast because he has some really interesting things to say. But I thought this was a wonderful book. So, want to pick another number? We keep trying here. Well, ah, look at that. Thank you, sir. Thank you. You betcha. Enjoy it. So, what we have now, let them eat cake, right? We have cake, John has, there's coconut cake and there's chocolate cake. And so, um, sorry, help yourselves. And what we're